If you want a perfect example of why these gimmick pay-per-views need to go the hell away and actually saving these gimmick matches for stories that actually call for them, TLC 2020, perfect example. You just book yourself into a corner when you put these extreme stipulations on matches that just don't call for them, that don't have that level of heat, that don't get that type of interest. Sure, you'll be able to fool some of the kind of simpler fans that just look for moves and matches and high-impact shit, and that's all they care about. But for those of us with any level of discerning taste whatsoever, we need a little bit more. And this show, admittedly, until you got to the end, was largely a dud. Now, you look at that opening match. Like, you know, to, to, to take from an old Matt Hardy gimmick, we really should start calling Drew McIntyre Drew version 1.5. <laughs> you get it to, to match the number of viewers? <laughs> Shut up! Um, but Drew McIntyre, AJ Styles, TLC match for the WWE Championship. In no way, shape, or form did this match call for a TLC stipulation. And yet, because you have the stupid-ass TLC pay-per-view that you have to book for every December, you're going to make this a TLC match. And you end up with one of your world championships opening the show. Which, if you had a loaded card, or it was trying to separate out, like, I get it to a degree. Like, only one of the two world titles that you have can main event. And in this case, neither one of them actually technically main evented. But, you know, from the jump, it's just telling me that, hey, Raw's your B show, Drew's your B champion. As our tribal chief so eloquently put it, why would you really care? And not only that, speaking of gimmick pay-per-views that need to die, money in the bank. You get about halfway through the match where these guys are just largely going through the motions, and out comes The Miz and Morrison, and Miz is going to cash in his money in the bank briefcase. You talk about a, a cool concept that they've just run into the ground, a cool concept that they have just made completely worthless. They certainly did that on this show. Because you just throw the Miz in to a TLC match to make it a triple threat. So you make him look like an idiot. One. Two. You had Otis win it just to have the Miz win it, just to have nobody do anything with it whatsoever. You talk about a missed opportunity. Like, the Money in the Bank briefcase... I understand not every single time should the person necessarily cash in successfully because then that can also get pathetically predictable as a pattern. But typically you should be putting it on people that you have really big plans for and a really big vision for. And clearly this was not the case here. This was a complete waste of a stipulation within a waste of a stipulation of a match just to have LOL Drew wins. And you had to know where this is going because they were having the Broken Skull session with Drew McIntyre after the pay-per-view. So, obviously, he wasn't losing this match. Like, the most memorable thing about this match, admittedly, is when Morrison hit almost, um, you know, AJ Styles' version of Diesel in the back and the chair snap. Like, that's a good use of a gimmick chair. Like, that was an impressive spot, but that was it. This just largely felt like these guys were going through the motions and just kind of bumping around, and there was no heat to it. There was no reason to care about it. Drew wins, and he's back to being an irrelevant world champion again. Yay, Drew version 1.5. A similar thing with Carmella versus Sasha Banks for the SmackDown Women's Championship. I saw a lot of people talking about how this was probably Carmella's best match or one of her best matches. Well, A, that doesn't mean much. That's not saying much. It's like Bears fans trying to say, hey, Trubisky had, an, he had a really good game when he throws for 202 yards. You know what I mean? Like, relative to other performances of that individual, it probably is good. But in the wider scope, when you're comparing it across the board, it's not. And to me, this is a perfect example of you could do moves in a match, but that doesn't make it good. Like, to me, it's not just about the moves that you make, but how crisp are the transitions, how crisp are those actual moves. And several moves in this match were kind of sloppy and herky-jerky and poorly pieced together. And not to mention the fact that this is the type of match 
where you should be trying to make a star out of Sasha Banks. And this felt like it was way more about Carmella than it was Sasha Banks. Sasha Banks is the one with the mainstream exposure. Sasha Banks is the one that's got the the mo, if you will. She's the one that you should be throwing your your stock behind. But what is it, Vince? Because you're not behind her getting the role on The Mandalorian, you, you just can't go there with her? Like, again, why do you put the belt on her if you don't give a crap about her? And some of you are going to say that I'm overreacting, and you know what? You're entitled to your opinion, and you should also get used to being wrong. Because you cannot look at this match and think that this was about anything other than Carmella and giving her as much shine as possible. And Sasha Banks retaining here was kind of a, a forgotten element of formality. This is not good. Like this is If I'm going to crap on companies like AEW for their stupid 50-50 booking, I'm certainly going to do it here with WWE as well. This is a peak example of everybody's got to get to crap in and nobody really gets over as a result. Sorry, it's the way I saw it. You had the Raw Tag Team Championship match. You know, this would be a smoky special back in the day. The New Day versus the Hurt Business. Um, you know, it was okay. I barely remember the actual match other than maybe the nice little touch of Cedric tagging in on Shelton so that way he could win the titles for the team. That said, it's crazy to think of. It's been over a decade and a half since Shelton Benjamin, I believe, was last a tag team champion in WWE, so it's nice to see him in that spot. Um, but this was an okay match, but nothing special. Uh, you know, and, and looking at this match, the only thing I could help thinking of is they're talking about the Hurt Business has all the gold. No, they don't. They don't have the world championship. Let's get them the world championship, too. And some of you wanted to opine and say, well, why don't you just have Lashley win it and then maybe hand off the U.S. title to MVP? I don't care. Personally, I think there's much more interest in story there with MVP going after Drew, it's my opinion, uh, than there is a Bobby Lashley. That said, if that's the route you want to go down, that's fine. But for this faction, like probably one of the few really good acts that WWE has, um, let's go ahead and give them the world title, too. What's it going to hurt? Seriously. What's it going to hurt at this point? Um, then you get to the Women's Tag Team Championship match, and I think everybody could see this coming. And this is just, again, this is why people aren't watching Raw anymore. Because you did all of this stuff forever with Nia Jax and Lana, and your payoff is what? Survivor Series, where Lana's the sole survivor because you make her look like an idiot standing on the ring steps? The fact that she pinned Nia a couple weeks ago and then you have her taken out with injury. Like, this is where it, it's just, you feel like with this company that everything's a waste of time and nothing really matters. Because this here should have been where Asuka's bringing in Alana and Lana's getting over on Nia and Asuka and Lana maybe win the tag titles. Like, in a logical world, that's what you would do. But that's clearly not what they did here because it's Charlotte time! The queen is back! Ah. I can't imagine looking at her with her sloppy-ass moonsault, her man-ass, having ass and thinking that this is what a star is supposed to be. Like, the epitome of not being able to see just how forced she is down your throats. This is very similar to the Randy Orton treatment. It took years for people to really catch on to the fact that, oh, maybe Randy Orton's not that much of a star, no matter how much they try to tell me she is. Like... It almost feels like it's perfectly timed. Maybe some people are getting over, so as a result, Charlotte's got to come back and ruin it all. This match was what it was, and, you know, I think Charlotte's boring as piss, personally. So, no, I wasn't excited about her return. No, I don't really care, and I'm not geeked to see her and Asuka as tag champions, and I'm not geeked to potentially see her and Asuka wrestle for the Raw Women's title at WrestleMania. Why the hell would I? Because we know how that's going to end. LOL, Charlotte wins. And I'm good with that. So up to this point in time in the show, to me it was not good. It was a really, really bad pay-per-view. Some of you are going to disagree, and I don't care. That's your opinion. You enjoy what you enjoy. I'll not enjoy what I don't enjoy. But thankfully, we got to the business at hand. What really mattered here, the TLC match for the Universal Championship. Kevin Owens versus Roman Reigns. And this was fantastic. Like, everything that the Raw Championship wasn't, this Universal Championship TLC match was. In a short period of time, you had built heat between Roman 
in KO and legitimate heat to the point where you had went so far to where even though you're relatively short into the program, you absolutely positively could justify having a TLC match. And in normal circumstances, this match absolutely 100% should have main evented. Thankfully, Roman understood that, you know, hey, it's getting to the holiday time now and the kids are already in bed. I want to be home with my family. So, yeah, let that Inferno match go on last. I'm cool with that. Like, what what a charitable tribal chief he truly is. But, but again, this match was fantastic. But you think about all the obstacles that Roman had to overcome here. He had a pot-bellied, pissed-off Canucker in Kevin Owens who was going to do anything he could to beat him. You had all these weapons available, which puts Roman, our tribal chief, at great risk of bodily injury. Not to mention the fact that he has to deal with the incompetence of his cousin Jay. Like, you know at some point in time, Jay's going to screw it up. So you think about all of these things that Roman had to overcome, and he still was able to do it. And he broke no rules. He didn't ask Jay for his help. Jay, again, as he always does with his stubborn-headed ass, his hard-headed ass, took it upon himself to get involved. Almost screwed up the day because that's what Jay does. And folks wonder why Roman has to beat that ass sometimes because Jay's a hard-headed little kid. And sometimes you got to beat their ass to beat some sense into them, I guess. Um... But you're going to hear, ooh, he hit him with a low blow. It is a tribal taint thrust. How many times do I have to tell you that? It is not a low blow. Tribal taint thrust. Look it up. Well, this match was great. Kevin Owens looks like a million bucks in defeat. And Roman Reigns looks like a million bucks in victory. Wrestling doesn't have to be that hard. It can be as simple as this. You get a great baby face like Roman Reigns, and you throw him up against somebody like Kevin Owens, and everybody wins. That's right, a great baby face. Jerks. Hey, Roman's a heel. Roman's a heel. Why? What has he done to be hateable? I'm just saying. But yeah, this match was fantastic. And if you have to sit through some of that other crap to get to this match, it's kind of worth it, admittedly. And it's not just because of Roman that this match was great. Kevin Owens was spectacular here. He absolutely was. And the dynamics of it worked. They actually told the story like, I love this TLC match. Imagine if this was just a standard December pay-per-view where you just had regular matches and then this was a TLC match. The only regret that I have is that this match did not happen in front of a live audience because if it had, the fans would have been going absolutely ape shit at this point. So it's a shame in the year 2020 that a match like this gets burned without it having being in front of 15 or 20,000 screaming fans. That sucks. Uh, but outstanding masterpiece of work here. Which brings us to the main event. <laughs> Hashtag Breakfast Club rules, bitches. <laughs> if I remember correctly... 2010 TLC. That year I did with John Cena exhibiting a fantastic burial of young talent in dumping a hundred chairs on top of Wade Barrett. Ten years later, it's still the Breakfast Club in the main event doing Breakfast Club business. And apparently, when USA said they wanted to see more violence, they were lying because apparently murder is acceptable in WWE today. Like, at the beginning of this Inferno or Fly Firefly Inferno match, with tongue twister, this Firefly Inferno match, it's Orton versus The Fiend. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, you go in the first couple of minutes, I'm like, are we just going to wrestle for a few minutes and then somebody gets a you know, like a torch or a Zippo lighter or something. And then eventually we got into it. I'm like, oh, okay. It's still going to be largely, largely a wrestling match with a few scary looking things mixed in and then some type of fiery finish. And boy, did I underestimate that. Um, hats off to both of these guys, putting them in a situation where working with fire like that and, you know, pouring lighter fluid and gasoline on themselves. Like, that's not cool. <laughs> you know, that's risky. And not everybody will put themselves in their spot. So hats off to both of them for doing just that. You know, I guess that speaks to the power of child support. And when you're the fiend, you got to do whatever it takes. 
gotta do whatever it takes to feed your family because the man got kids. The man got kids. He doesn't have Tony Schiavone level kids, but then again, who is that type of walking sperm factory? Um, but the finish, and everybody's going to talk about the finish and how this is a burial of Bray Wyatt. It's a burial of the fiend. Um, it's a murder. Maybe that's a burial. Was there really enough heat between these two to get to this point where you're trying to literally set one of the characters on fire? Was that really called for here? And even if it was, like, what do you do with the Fiend, the Bray Wyatt character from here? Like, what did, purpose did this really serve? How is that going to help anybody? You've got Randy Orton going over who's supposed to be one of your top guys and certainly one of your top merch movers at the end of 2020. It's LOL, Breakfast Club, baby. <laughs> new year, new decade, same old shit if you've ever seen it. So I get it where people are thinking, well, that was stupid and they just buried the fiend. Like, you could say that's perhaps an overreaction, but huh. he, Randy Orton did just kind of murder him. You know, and part of the whole thing about The Fiend and the revenge circuit, that's kind of this whole shtick, and then you just have him get beat by Randy Orton like this. Like, weird. Weird. Visually looked great. Had a lot of shock value to it. But what's the value that this really drives? So I can't sit here and rant and rave as about it being a total and complete burial, but if some fans are saying that right now, I understand it. Because it doesn't look good, that's for sure. For those that are going to sit there and say, well, you got to let the story play out and give them the benefit of the doubt. You're talking about Raw talent on Monday Night Raw. The fuck has that show done to earn any benefit of the doubt here? What have they done? Nothing. And for you to suggest that they've earned the benefit of the doubt is a severe disconnection from reality and borderline just flat-out delusional. It's not even borderline. That's just delusional. It was a cool match. It was a cool way to end the show. So, like, the, the last two matches really made up for the first half of this show because the first half-plus of this show sucked. It sucked. The last two matches were interesting. The last two matches had me emotionally invested. And that's what I look for in professional wrestling. Can you hook me? Can you suck me in? Can you get me emotionally invested into what is going on? And Kevin Owens versus Roman Reigns, the TLC match for the Universal Championship, absolutely positively did that on a variety of different levels. And the Firefly Inferno match absolutely did it on a variety of different levels. So for that reason and that reason alone, I did end up enjoying the show and it being a success. But, you know, again, I only really liked two out of the six matches. But the ones that I liked, I liked a lot. So you can let me know what you thought about WWE TLC 2020. You can tell me about how great our tribal chief is. You can tell me your thoughts about whether or not Bray Wyatt the Fiend has been buried. When in reality... He technically was just murder. Let me know in the comments. Remember, I'm the Schleg Daddy, and this is OTRS Central. Not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. I'll see you later.